messages um, that I want to talk about today associated with the project around the reconstruction and redisplay of the Temple of Mithras are responding to the, the key words in, the, in this conference that archaeology is highly valued and can be highly valued as a source of inspiration for artists and very much a, a source of differentiation for, for our clients. Um, I think this project illustrates the benefits of collaboration, collaboration, openness, generosity um, between disciplines. And those, if any of you were at the Design the Ideal Archaeologist session yesterday, these were key words that, that we needed. And it's a project that <coughs> creates a legacy as a, as a very, very popular visitor attraction in London, but also it's a space in which archaeology um, will continue to be reinterpreted by artists. Um, I realised this morning, of course, that art is not a fine art resource. We can have artists continue reinterpreting and telling stories about our, our work. So, uh, just a little bit about the Temple of Mithras, first of all, uh, I'm sure many of you know this. Um, it was first discovered in 1954, purely by chance, on long site in the city of London. Largely because of the sort of excellent preservation of the structure and the artefacts within it, and the fact that the head of Mithras was found on the last day of the excavation, um, it led to a huge, huge public and press response. It was unparalleled. Um, the, the, the amount of interest in the, in the discovery. Um, this article I thought was written in the Daily Mail. Um, 30,000 people queued pretty much every day just for a, a, an hour and a half slot in the afternoon to see the site. Because of the press and public interest, um, there was um, a huge amount of debate going on um, in the press and in government about what should happen to the Temple of Mithras. Should it be preserved in situ and the building that was about to be built um, redesigned, or was it, was it fine for it just to be swept away? Thinking about it and looking back after 60-something years, this is the moment where PPG 16 should have come in. And had it done so, we'd be a much richer uh, country, nation, culturally. We'd have had so much more archaeology to, to, to talk about and, and enjoy. Um, it didn't happen. The government said, for reasons which are quite understandable, that the, the temple had to, had to go. And it had been well recorded. And that is what would have happened if it wasn't for the fact that the site owners, who were legal and general, um, felt that something should happen. And they, at their own cost, said, we will dismantle the Temple of Mithras. We will put it into storage, all the stones into storage for a bit, and then reconstruct it somewhere else a bit more convenient on our site when our building is finished. So I don't know if you can see, it's at the bottom of the picture. <coughs> this is a, 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 the, the, the temple was reconstructed in 1962. This is uh, 2008, 2009, just before Buffer Street House, which is the, the Legal and General building that was, that was built in the 50s, just before it was about to be demolished. And at the bottom there, you can see the Temple of Mithras. It was, uh, uh, it was a reconstruction. It was good that it was done, but it was not done well. It was put together with hard cement mortar. It had crazy paving. It lost all the architectural detail of a Mithraeum. So, so not, a good, not a good thing. And pretty much immediately after it was opened, the sort of voices in archaeology and heritage in, in London started mumbling about if anything happens to Buckley Street House, we have to do something better with this. So when Legal and General thought about redeveloping their site in 2004, the City of London, uh, John Shepherd, uh, a freelance archaeologist, and uh, Jenny Hall, who was at the Museum of London at the time, and Catherine Stubbs, who's the curator of the, of the city, got together and they came up with a brief for what should happen. That if, if the site is redeveloped, then the Temple of Mithra should be dismantled again and the Roman material should be salvaged and reused in a new reconstruction. It should be put back where it was originally found and at the right level. Um, we should provide accurate information for visitors, make it free and accessible to all. And then the real weird one, um, which is provide the evocation of the Mithraeum as it might have been used, which is given that this is effectively sitting behind a planning condition, this is a brief one, it's quite an odd thing to have in your planning condition as a developer you have to provide an evocation for the Mithraeum as it might have been used. Because, for a start, we don't actually know what went on in the Mithraeum because it's a mystery cult and there's no liturgy or descriptions that can be pieced together. This is actually an artist reconstruction. Judith Doby from um, Historic England did this one recently for us. But having that little clause, though, was, was fantastic. And I would say uh, to any curators in the room or anyone involved in writing briefs or specification, this is the moment, you know, there are moments when you can be brave and you can ask for something extra. And by just putting this little thing in, it meant not only that it was a possibility that the designers of this new reconstruction could be creative, they had to be creative. 
they had to come up with something which was uh, an experience, um, something, something different. It was also high risk because it could have been pretty dust, you know, ghastly. Um, you, could, you could get a very Disney version of the Temple of Mithras, and you could also offend all the many scholars who think this or that about Mithras, and so tricky as well. Fortunately, um, thanks to the financial crisis, in some ways, um, the original developers, we, developers didn't get the site, they went bankrupt, and Bloomberg, uh, the financial news and information company, were able to pick up the site, a massive three-acre site right next to the uh, sort of Bank of England and Mansion House. They picked that up in, in 2010. And it's very important, two very important th things in, in this story, really, uh, about Bloomberg getting the site. Um, one, they are an owner, they're not only a developer, they wanted to occupy the building, and that's tremendously helpful, so they actually cared about what it was they were building. Um, and two, um, Mike Bloomberg is a tremendous supporter of the arts. He's a great philanthropist and also um, really, really interested, in, interested in encouraging contemporary art and, and he's you know, supported, he's, he's actually the, uh, I think, the chair of the Serpentine Gallery in London, amongst other things. So <clears throat> that was very, very good and, and promising in terms of the, the Temple of Mithras reconstruction. The other thing that was very, very helpful for this project was the, the, the importance and the value given to archaeology right from the start. And the, 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 the whole team understood that this was a very special and unique thing about this scientific aspect. But it was also, if the Temple of Mithras was reconstructed wrongly, it could spoil the whole massive three-acre beautiful Foster's building. So a lot of um, effort was put into getting the right team. And Key was having a consulting curator at the top, was Nancy Rosen, here, standing next to Bethany Hughes, who's not in the team, don't watch us doing that. Um, <laughs> yeah, nice issue. Um, Nancy was, um, we were again talking yesterday about the idea of archaeologists. Nancy Rosen had um, emotional intelligence um, in, 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 in packet loads of it and was very, very good, but she's also from an art background. And she was on the client side helping to say, set the, the client's brief for the Temple of Mithras reconstruction. And she came up with a, 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 a sort of three words for what she wanted the, the, the whole experience and the Mithraeum to be. And that was accurate, memorable, and powerful. And I think actually, if we could think about that for our own archaeological publications and our outputs, that's a pretty good thing to go for, accurate, memorable, and powerful. And I wonder how many of those we actually, actually achieve sometimes. Also, I'd say that when we were talking yesterday about the idea of archaeologists, about inclusivity and collaboration, that was absolutely key. And, you know, the, the local authority curator, Catherine Stubbs, was absolutely part of the, the team. She offered advice, we all offered, offered our talks on the artistic and uh, design contributions and so on. It helped that Nancy Rosen was also responsible for the major art commissions which went into the building. I know this is an exceptional thing, you don't get this in every project. But four international artists were asked to produce really, really significant works. The, the Oliver Eliasson um, piece, which is in this amazing sort of foster design entrance, is truly spectacular. Um, and all of them, um, outside there's in the public space, there's this um, Christina Iglesias one. All of them, they weren't made to, but they all reference archaeology and history. They're all based around archaeology. These two um, uh, pick up the the fact that there was a, a sort of lost river underneath the site, and the Arturo Herrera is a felt hanging, which includes um, images and, and abstract representations of the artifacts found on the site. So everybody just, you know, wanted to wanted to use archaeology and take it to make the site special. The exhibition, Christ, my goodness, the exhibition designers, right? I'm, I'm doing. The exhibition designers' uh, local projects also. Um, took a, a, a sort of artistic response to it, and they put a, a, an artist on their team, a man called Matthew Schreiber, who's a light artist. Lights were very important in Mithraea, I haven't got time to go into that. Um, and they wanted to work with light and use light to create a sense of superstructure by projecting walls of light through a fine mist. And that was the sort of key part of the, of the interpretation. Uh, he did prototypes, which looked very effective, but it was bloody difficult to get it to work in a real space. And this is actually a life-size mock-up that we, we did in the, to, to make it work. 
This is a warehouse in Battersea. Um, obviously, in the background, <coughs> there was <coughs> a huge amount of work going on to do a very, very faithful and accurate reconstruction. That's what the original looked like. And then this doesn't really do it justice. That is the, um, the, the space as it is, uh, as you can go in. And, and um, it is an immersive experience with sound, light, um, and is, is proving to be very, very popular. Just to, to finish, there's a, there's a three-level three space. So there's the uh, uh, reconstruction at the lower level and a mezzanine space just, just here where you can find out about who Mithras is, which has the same kind of minimalist aesthetic, really, which is, is to get you into the, into the mood and provide information about Mithraism. Um, a case of artefacts was also designed very much with a, a, an artist architect, and it's, it's designed to be a piece of art as well as something you would interrogate as, as an archaeological museum case. But the real wonderful thing about it is they've kept the ground floor space as a gallery which every six months they get a contemporary artist to come in and produce a new installation which is inspired by the archaeology on the site. Um, what a fantastic, fantastic gift to London. This one is first one by an Irish artist called Isabel Nolan and she took her inspiration, believe it or not, from Grimes' um, original excavation drawings. There was another, the next one was by an Argentinian artist called Pablo Bronstein, London in its original splendour. London, of course, never looked like that, but that's what artists do. <laughs> uh, there's it in action with children doing stuff in it. And the most recent one is Shift, where Claudia Wies has actually <coughs> done her own reinterpretation of the case. Um, and this is going to change every six months, so the next one will check, come in in July. So it's been tremendously popular. Uh, Tremendously popular. I, yeah, Trip, TripAdvisor is fantastic for, for reviews of heritage, what people think of heritage. It's not going to be the best day of your life. I have to manage your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Just a quick postscript. Buckfastbury House. Um, Legal and General also commissioned art. Some fantastic glass engraved panels, which we've almost forgotten about uh, within the building. They've now been reinstalled in the bank tube station entrance, which is part of this part of this development, so, so it continues. So to conclude, I would say don't underestimate the value of archaeology to creative people. Be generous, open and brave in what, if you get the chance to design a project. And every project has the potential for an artistic interpretation and legacy, whether it's from a local primary school up to an international artist. Thank you.